Welcome to the House of God International Headquarters, located in Lexington, Kentucky. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast today. We know that you will be blessed. To learn more about the House of God, visit us online at www.houseofgod.org. Be blessed. God bless all of you today. So happy to be with you again. I do give God praise and honor, thanksgiving for allowing us to be together once again on our uh, weekly presentation. We appreciate you so very much uh, for taking the time to share with us. Uh, those of you that are friends uh, that tune in each week, we want to thank you as well, along with our House of God members that are with us weekly. Praise God for you. Pray that God is continuing to bless you and your household. And certainly I pray that you're being as safe as you possibly can uh, during this time of the resurgent of the COVID-19 and the Delta virus and all those things that are going on. Uh, do everything you can to be safe. Uh, watch your contact with others. Use your mask. Use your sanitizing. And certainly remember the distance. I know you're restless, as I am, and all of us are. We want this to be over. But until God, uh, uh, while God is being merciful to us during this time, we want to take advantage of his mercy and do everything that we can to be saved. So just remember that. I hope you don't get tired of me saying that every week. But it's just that important. It seems like each week I find uh, someone that I know that has contracted the uh, Delta variant or COVID-19. Uh, we're still experiencing deaths from those uh, occurrences. So please, please, please be as cautious and careful as you can. Having said that, I know that all of you know by now that our convocation this year uh, will be virtual because of the increase of the virus. But we're working very hard. The program committee is working very hard try to come up with a, a program uh, presentation for the annual convocation uh, that will be a benefit to all of us. There are adjustments you make for virtual format. Uh, we're working very hard to make those. But in addition to that, we want it to be very meaningful, very good. And uh, we have every uh, positive thought that we're going to be able to accomplish that. So thank God for you. We appreciate your presence. The other thing that I'm excited about, and we started talking about this last week, and that is the celebration of the Lord's Feast Days uh, in the closing uh, biblical month, uh, seventh, the seventh biblical month on God's calendar. We're very, very excited about that. Uh, the first feast, we just finished celebrating it. Is the Feast of Trumpets. Those of you that are feast observers, I know that you have uh, had a wonderful feast. The feast that we had locally here was just glorious. We thank God for his visitation during the feast, and we're looking forward uh, to the remainder of the feast of the seventh month. Of course, the next feast that we will be celebrating is the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, and then the final one uh, for uh, the, the feast season is the Feast of Tabernacles. So I'm very excited about it, and I know that uh, uh, the more you learn about the feast, the more you familiarize yourself with them, the more meaningful they become. And if you've not had the experience of learning about the feast or being in the feast service, uh, we encourage you to do some investigation, uh, do some little independent study, uh, and I think you will find that the feast or something that uh, God has ordained himself in, in worship of him and recognition of him. So we want to talk about the Feast of Trumpets just a little bit more today. Uh, we had such an exciting feast uh, in our local sanctuary. I hope that you had exciting feast as well. One of the things I want to say about the, the Feast of Trumpets, and, and this is true of all the feasts, these are God's feasts. 
I know that sometimes we associate them with various religious groups, but it the, the feast days belong to God. They don't belong to the house of God. They don't belong to any other denomination. They don't belong to any religious group. They really are the Lord's feast. And we find out that very quickly when we read uh, Leviticus 23 and those other support scriptures for feast days, we find out that these are identified as the feast of the Lord. And in those instances where God talks about them, he says, these are my feasts. These are my feasts. Uh, you're the ones to, to observe them or proclaim them to others, but they belong to me. They recognize some uh, event uh, that I have uh, perpetrated, something that I've done that I want to be memorialized. I want to be remembered. They're all about God. They're all about God. And from a historic uh, standpoint, uh, sometimes people leave them in the historic stage. You say, well, that's the way it was. That was the way it was back when Moses was alive. That's the way it was when the, the patriarchs were alive. That was the way it was when the prophets were in the prophets. But believe me, feasts have a present-day application as well. Because you won't find any place in the scriptures where God did away with the feast days. He ordained them, he sanctioned them, and they have been in effect ever since. Now, the present day application of the Holy Feast days really is centered around Jesus Christ. You say, oh, you mean the feast days pertain to Jesus? The feast days are about Jesus in their present day application. They are about Jesus Christ. And looking forward, as we all are, to the future, the, the feast days looking forward are about Jesus Christ and his return. So they're all about Jesus. And, and the foundation of the feast days, of course, takes place in the historic feast where we find out when the days are, what month they are, what day they are, where the holy days are, whether they're one day or two days or seven days. We find all of that out when we read in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and all of those books that give us the foundation. That's where we learn about them. And that's where we learn about the historic part. We learn about the exodus out of Egypt. We learn about the original Passover. We learn about all of those things that are the original and the historic part of the feast. But when we start looking at the present day, the emphasis shifts to Jesus Christ. Because in all of the cases, Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the feast days. When I say fulfillment, that does not mean that they're done away with. It simply means that he brought the feast days into reality uh, through his acts. Passover was wonderful. They started with Passover. Uh, the feast started with Passover. Uh, the, the, the feast celebrations, Sabbath is one of God's feast days as well. But those memorialized events started with Passover. Started with Passover. And you know from your Bible studies, you know that Jesus Christ, one, was a Passover observer. Two, he became the Passover himself. So that brings even more relevance to the Lord's feast days. So uh, we want to continue to talk about the uh, Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets, uh, sometimes people look at the Feast of Trumpets and say, what in the world is the Feast of Trumpets about? Why do you observe the Feast of Trumpets? What does it mean? What is it about? Well, I want to tell you what the Feast of Trumpets really is about. In the foundational scriptures in Leviticus, God says it would be a, a day of the memorial of blowing trumpets. Well, you look at that in Leviticus chapter 23, and then you read Numbers chapter 10, verse 10 verses. God memorialized all the ways the trumpets were used, the events around the trumpet, everything from blowing the trumpet to the summons the people together to come to meeting, uh, used in battle and war, uh, used in ceremonial things, all of those things the trumpets were used. So he, he said, I want to I want to have a day. I want to set aside a day for the memorial of the blowing of trumpets and, and, and what all of that is meant. That's the original concept that he had. That's the historic piece. And the trumpet, as you know from your Bible readings, 
you know that the trumpet had so many memorable, uh, transformative events that changed things. You remember the, the, the first conquest uh, that Joshua had, the first conquest, big battle that he had uh, in taking Canaan and all of that, came up against Jericho, the city of Jericho. Fortified city with huge, thick, impenetrable walls. Question was, how do we get through this? How do, how do we how do we manage this? We're not equipped to handle these walls. These walls are so thick you can drive two or three chariots side by side or more on top of these walls. They're huge. And they had no way to deal with it. God devised a plan. And that plan incorporated the use of trumpets. The use of trumpets, sounding the trumpet blowing the trumpet, praising God. Miracle happened. They marched around those walls for seven days blowing the trumpets. On the final day, God says, all right, on the final day, I want you to go around seven times. When you get around seven times, I want you to blow the horns, I want the trumpets, I want you to shout, I want you to lift up your voices. I don't know how this happened. It was through the power of God. But that wall fell flat as the priest and those blew those trumpets shouted praise God the walls fell but God used a trumpet so when you talk about memorializing the, the use of the trumpet memorializing how the trumpet was used uh, there were so many incidents you know the story of Gideon and, and how the trumpets and the pictures and the lanterns and all of that happened. The trumpet God has used in so many occasions, sacred occasions, holy occasions, occasions of war, where the trumpet played a critical part. So we had a day of memorializing, remembering the use of the trumpet. Let me share this with you. When God memorializes, he memorializes past, present and future. He knew exactly what he was going to do with that trumpet before he did it. So he memorialized the events. He memorialized the use of the trumpet. So past, historic, present, future application of God's holy feast days. This one, Feast of Trumpets, for all of you that are believers in Jesus Christ, I encourage you to look into the Feast of Trumpets because the Feast of Trumpets is a big part of God's plan of salvation. You know if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you know you're looking forward to the day when Jesus Christ will return to this earth. Yes, you are. That is your hope. Because you know that when that happens, there are going to be some very special things that happen for all believers. And those things will not be prevented by death or any other condition. You know that because you believe in Jesus Christ. Let me share this with you, very beloved scripture, John chapter 14. I love to go there because these were the last times... Uh, during the last time Jesus had with his disciples before his suffering, before his suffering, uh, before his death. And he told those beloved disciples on that night before his suffering, he said to them, he says, I am going away. I'm going to leave you. I'm going to leave you going away. But then he says, don't worry about it. He didn't use those words. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Don't worry about it, men. I've got this covered. I'm going away, but here's a point I want you to understand, disciples. If I go away, I'm coming back. When I come back, I'm coming back for you. 
I'm coming back for you. I'm coming back to receive you. That you can be with me. And that where I am, you'll be also. I'm coming back for you. And I remember a conversation uh, that developed as a result of that uh, with Thomas. Because Thomas is love. We don't know where you're going. I don't know where you're going. And I certainly don't know the way. And that brings up a critical point in our discussion on the Feast of Trumpets. On the Feast of Trumpets. Because out of all of you that trust God, believe God, that are looking forward to the, to the resurrection of the dead in Christ, that are looking forward to that, that wonderful time in Christ. There's something coupled with that. In many of the cases where you read about it. And that is the trumpet. The trumpet. The sound of the trumpet. Paul writes glorious writings. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he writes glorious writings about the return of Jesus Christ that Jesus is talking about in John chapter 14. I am going away. And I'm going away to prepare a place for you. I've got some work to do. I'm going to prepare a glorious city for you. I'm going to prepare a city for you like you've never seen before. Where the streets are paved with gold. I'm going to create a place for you that architects can't imagine. Engineers can't imagine the kind of place that I'm creating for you. And when it's ready, and when the time is right, I'll return. That was language that the disciples just could not grasp. And that's why Thomas says, I, I, I don't know the way. And I want to tell you today, you don't either. And I don't either. You may be a believer, worshiper, come to church, sing songs, do all of that, but you don't know the way. You don't know the way. You're depending on Christ and his plan. Jesus says in that same chapter, in verse 6, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the way. No man comes into the Father but by me. You can't get to heaven. On your own. You can't get there. You can't come out of the grave. On your own. So when we look at the Feast of Trumpets. It is directing us. To that time. When Christ. Shall. Return. In compliance. Of his own words. I'm going to return. I'll come again. And the thing that will herald my coming. Is a trumpet. The trumpet. Will herald. Announce. Alert. Awaken you to the return of Jesus Christ. The Feast of Trumpets is about Jesus and his return. Now, I know that many of you that are not familiar with the Feast of Trumpets, you think it's some old, archaic, something that happened way back under the law, way back uh, in, in Leviticus, way back in Deuteronomy, it's something they did that had no relevance for you. That is not true. That is not true at all. 
It has all the relevance for you. Connected with Jesus Christ. The Feast of Trumpets is about the return of Jesus Christ. Let me read some interesting scriptures for you. From Matthew chapter 24. These are the words of our Lord himself. Paul did not write this. John did not write this. The disciples did not write this. These are the words of Jesus himself. Looking at the trumpet connected with his return. Listen to this. Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31. And let me, I, I want to share this too. Because we're going through a difficult time now. We are experiencing one of the most difficult, complex times in the history of our nation. There is a virus that is ravaging our country, not only our country, but around the world. And it's a difficult time. It is a very difficult time. And some 600,000 more people have died because of this virus. And people are, are suffering in so many places, if not physically suffering, mentally depressed and full of concern and full of anxiety and full of all those things. It's a tough time. It's a tough time on health workers. It's a tough time for school teachers. It's a tough time for our little children. It's a tough time socially. It's a tough time for ministry when you want to be in contact with people. It's a difficult time. And it's an uncertain time. Well, Jesus spoke of a time many times, many folds more in terms of difficulty than that. It's in Matthew 24. Let me read it for you. In verse 30 and 31. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the cloud of heaven with power and great glory. What he says before this, what he says before this, is that trouble, tribulation, pain, suffering, cataclysmic conditions, the sun being obscured, the world being troubled with darkness. A time like the world has never seen before. He sets that backdrop for these comments, these words that I just read. And then he says this, I want you to understand that conditions do not prevent God from doing his work. And tough times do not prevent him from preserving and protecting his own. Tough times do not prevent him from redeeming his own. He says this about those times. Great tribulation. Great turmoil that the world will be facing. Future tense. And he says, except those days be shortened. Except those days be limited. Except those days be curtailed. That no flesh would be saved. And that means preserved. There would be annihilation of the human race. But he says this for you, believers. 
Those that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. He says for the elect sake. Those that he has chosen. Those that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Those that have been redeemed. Those that have his spirit. Those that live by his code. Those that recognize him. He says for their sake. Those days would be shortened. Now that's what he says in the verses leading up to verses 30 and 31. And in verse 31, I want you to pay attention to this. Matthew 31. Oh, how beloved it is. And how it explains the memorial of the trumpet, of the sound of the trumpet, that's been defined in Leviticus 23. Listen to this. This is Jesus. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to another. What is this saying? That trumpet, hallelujah, glory to God, that trumpet that God instituted the memorial, that trumpet that he instituted a feast about, that trumpet will sound. God will gather his saints, his believers, from all over the world. They will be gathered. Those that have been mortared for the faith in Jesus Christ. Those that have stood up against impossible odds, Jesus Christ. Those that did not compromise the plan of salvation and righteousness to Jesus Christ. Those that died rather than give in those that suffered all manner of persecution, like Stephen's, like John, who was beheaded, like many of those that died supporting the name Jesus Christ. Christ himself says, I'm going to send my angels with the sound of a trumpet and gather my saints from throughout the ages. Those that died, those that suffered, those that remain, those that are alive, I'm going to gather all of them. The Feast of Trumpets directs us to the return of Jesus Christ. It is not some cold, insensitive law or ordinance that has no relevance for today. The Feast of Trumpets is about Jesus Christ. How many times have you heard preachers preach concerning the return of Jesus Christ? That the trump shall sound, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The Feast of Trumpets is about that. But we don't connect that. We don't connect that with the ordinance of the Feast of Trumpets. Those are not words without purpose. Why the trumpet? 
What significance does a trumpet have? A trumpet has always been an alarm and alert to the great works that God's doing. It was an alarm when the feast days or holy days were coming. The trumpet was blown to alert the people concerning the need to assemble. It's always been a part of God's plan. So I'm saying the Feast of Trumpets is not something strange. It is not anti-Jesus Christ. It is the part of the, 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 the example of what's going to happen when Jesus returns. The trump will sound. I don't know how that works. Nobody really knows how that works. You believe it. You probably used that scripture when a very dear friend died. You went to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and the preacher preached from it. It's the most familiar text, one of the most familiar texts in the Bible. It gives us comfort. But I want you to see that that, that trumpet is not there by accident. It is there because it is a part of God's plan. The trump will sound. The dead in Christ will rise first. The trump will sound. The shout will come. And Paul personalizes it even more. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he says, The Lord himself. I want you to think about this. Because what happens with feast days, we separate the feast days from Jesus. The feast days in their present application and their future application are all about Jesus Christ. And most Bible readers, when they read, they read the feast days, the holy days, they read Passover, they read uh, Feast of Weeks, they read the Feast of Trumpets, they read all of those, and they, they look at them from a historic point of view. Meaning, they have no relevance for them. The Bible doesn't say that. And Jesus didn't say that. He said the trumpet, the feast, the trumpets, was about his return. I am going away to prepare a place for you. I'm coming back. When I come back, that trumpet's going to sound. It's going to sound. And that is your hope. That is your hope. All of those that have died thousands of years ago. That is the hope. All of those that have died of cancer, lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, stroke. All of those things that take us out of here. Christ has a plan for that. We must remember that. As we celebrate the feast, I encourage you to do some independent research. Read it yourself. Challenge yourself. Every time you read God's Word, you should challenge yourself to read, to understand. We've all come from traditions, we've all come from customs, we've all come from different practices, backgrounds, and that. Much of what we think and how we think. Are shaped by those experiences. And the same thing applies to religious faith and what you believe. And sometimes those backgrounds prevent us from looking at the Word of God in an objective way and letting the Word speak to us. As a preacher, I encourage you, don't take my word for it. Don't take my word for it. You read it. You see it. You understand it. And allow the Holy Spirit. I want to, I want to give you this thought, all of you. If, if you're listening to me today and you say, oh my goodness, the preacher's preaching about something I never heard of. He's, he's gone way back in the Old Testament. I, I left the Old Testament and I came over to your beloved New Testament Apostle Paul. I came over to your Messiah and your Redeemer, Jesus Christ. 
to make the point today that the feast is for you. It is for you. It is for all of us that believe in Jesus Christ. You say, well, I'm, that, 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 that's what Moses had. That's what Moses did. Well, let me tell you, Jesus Christ, if you understand him, his sacrifice was for humanity, all of mankind. And he gave us the opportunity to become sons and daughters of him through Jesus Christ. He's giving you the power to be one of his. And it matters not that you're black, that you're white, that you're Jew, that you're Gentile, that you're... It doesn't matter. The feast is for you. None of us own it. It's interesting. There's a, there's a Old Testament prophetic scripture that's written in Daniel chapter 12. I made I noted it here. Because Daniel saw something well beyond his days, well beyond his dispensation, well beyond his time. And he says this in Daniel chapter 12. I, I just find it, you know, God quickens us. There's a misunderstanding of that word too. We think it's jumping and shaking and moving. It really isn't. It's God bringing us alive. It's God dealing with our thoughts. It's God giving us understanding. It's God uh, uh, alerting us, quickening, bringing you alive to understand and to see. So God quickened Daniel. And when he quickened him with understanding, he said this, Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2. And at that time, Shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there should be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Every one that shall be found written in the book. By the way, there is a record being kept for you and me. God himself. But verse 2 gives a glimpse of the return of Jesus Christ and the power of the resurrection. In verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Now look at what he says after that. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. He's clearly talking about the return of of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the power of the resurrection. He's talking about the same thing that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Rise first. And a thousand years later, Those that are not in Christ will rise as well. Those that rise in Christ will rise to everlasting life, eternal bliss, Christ himself. Those that are part of the thousand year later resurrection, Daniel says they will rise to shame and everlasting contempt. This is clearly the resurrection. So I'm saying to you today, and I'm going to close, I don't want to get real long on this, because I get so excited about this, 
I could talk for hours. But what I want you to understand today, as we enter into the feast of the seventh month, the opening feast is the feast of trumpets. And the same system that was used in the Old Testament in sounding the alarm, God is sounding the alarm upon his return with the trump. I'm coming, I'm here, I'm here. You hear the trump? I'm following the trump. The dead in Christ, rise. What a day that will be. I want to be a part of that. And I'm making every effort to bring my body, my mind, my thoughts, my actions, my works, my passions under subjection in making ready for the day when Christ shall return. And I'm not relying on my strength only. Remember when we did the series on the development of the church after the ascension of Jesus Christ, it was the Holy Ghost that empowered them to deal with temptation, to deal with opposition, to deal with haters, to deal with all the things that they had to deal with. It was the Holy Ghost that empowered them to do it. So I'm saying, in preparation for the trumpet to sound, I'm using that resource. God, through the Holy Ghost, help me be able to stand in difficult times. Empower me to be able to bring my thoughts under subjection. Couple that with the Word of God. We have all of these resources. But I want, I'll leave on this. You do not want to miss that glorious event when Christ returns and comes for His beloved Saints. People say the church. That simply means all the believers. He's not coming for a building. He's coming for you. So we'll talk more. We may talk some more about the Feast of Trumpets. But it's, it's a wonderful time. It's an exciting time. I do challenge you. I challenge you. Do some research on your own. You can go back and read Leviticus if you wish. You can go back and read the the, the foundational scriptures on these feast days, but what you will find, what you will find, Christ came and he suffered and died. He became the essence of all the feast days. He is now the center and focus of the feast days. He brought them alive. He brought them alive in a way that you can feel and see and see his glory in them. That's what they're about. And when you see that, there's an excitement about God's feast days that will energize you in a way that you've not been energized before. Because it's about Jesus Christ. That's it. They're about him. They're about him. All right. God bless you today. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, the continuation of the feast. We're also looking forward to our virtual annual convocation, which comes up on the 23rd of September, goes through the 25th. We're looking forward to that. We're making preparations for it. Pray for us as we work through that. The program committee is making it one uh, that will be meaningful to you. Let us pray. Father and eternal God, we're so thankful to you today for all of your blessings and your mercy. We thank you for your goodness. And we thank you for the feast days. We thank you for the feast of the seventh month, which all point to your return. We thank you for that, God. And we pray that you will ever broaden our understanding. Give us the ability to explain and show the relevance of your holy feast days. Thank you for all things today. These prayers I pray in Jesus' name. 
Now the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all.